Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program, and we're essentially restarting this program from the very beginning. So if you're joining us, this is the real start of our group learning program, where we're starting from the very beginning, and we're going to be progressing through multiple classes over the next seven months. So I'd like to welcome all of you, whether you're taking this program again for a second, third, or fourth time, or whether this is your very first time taking this program, I'd like to welcome everyone. And the way that we start out this program is we start with a three-part series where we go through the Eightfold Path in detail. We're going to be having a class today where we discuss what's called right view and right intention using the words of the Buddha. And then we're going to go next week into right speech, right action, and right livelihood, which makes up the moral conduct of the Eightfold Path. And then the following week, we're going to be doing the right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, which makes up the mental discipline aspect of the Eightfold Path. This is going to give you a nice overview of the entire path to enlightenment, as well as going in detail to help you see a lot of the details, and we can explore each individual aspect of the Eightfold Path. The fourth week, what we're going to be doing is going into the four stages of enlightenment and talking about what these four stages are and how to actually attain them. And then in the meantime, each Wednesday over the next four Wednesdays, I'm going to be helping you to build up your breathing mindfulness meditation practice, where I'm going to be assuming that nobody's ever learned any meditation ever before, and I'll be helping you to build up your practice step by step each Wednesday. And of course, you'll need to be doing meditation on your own outside of class, but you'll have that Wednesday class to build up your meditation. And these two things together over the course of the next month is really going to progress you forward in understanding what this path to enlightenment is and how to actually attain it. For those of you guys that weren't able to attend on Wednesday, that was kind of the official restart of the group learning program. And that's recorded in YouTube, on the podcast, as well as in Facebook. You can learn what I shared there because there were some important things that I talked about in terms of the Buddhist path and this path to enlightenment is doesn't include belief. There's nothing that you should actually believe in terms of this path to enlightenment. And it's very, very important that you don't believe what I share, that you don't believe what the Buddha shared, that you don't believe the books that you read, but instead you learn, reflect, and practice the teachings. And I'm going to help you do that today. As I go through the class, I'm going to share some teachings with you. I'm going to help you learn. And then I'm going to help you to start reflecting and understanding what reflection means. And then I'm going to explain to you how to now move those teachings into practice so that you can start benefiting from acquiring the wisdom of the Buddhist teachings and start awakening the mind to this enlightened mental state where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no longer experiencing any discontent feelings. So even though Wednesday was our official restart of the group learning program, today is where we really start diving in and sinking our teeth into the actual teachings. And each Sunday, what we're going to be doing is covering a chapter in this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. You can download this book by going to buddhadailywisdom.com and you'll be able to download it by clicking on the button for free books. You can also take that file and go print it if you'd like a printed version, or you can order these nicely bound versions from amazon.com or whatever the equivalent is in your country. 
and there's Kindle versions as well. So you're gonna need a version of that book in order to really help you get the most benefit out of this program. Because in these classes, I will be teaching things that are part of those chapters and kind of drawing out some of the really important teachings of each individual chapter. But there are certain things in the chapter that I'm not going to have the time to cover in a class so you can gain that benefit from reading the chapter. And then there are certain things in classes sometimes that I will share that aren't part of the chapter as well. So the combination of coming to classes and reading the chapters will really help you to understand these teachings. And I'm sure over a seven month period, there's going to be situations where you're not able to come to class. And that's where you have the recordings on Facebook, YouTube, or in the podcast that you can actually digest this at your own pace. And that way you'll be able to continue with the program even on days where it doesn't work out for you to attend live. As we go forward in our class, you can actually ask questions as we go. I'll be pausing at different times in our class to give you a chance to ask questions, but as you have questions, you can actually put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom in the comment section. We have moderators who are monitoring that and will ask your question for you during the live class. Or if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly, and then your questions will help you to get clarity and more clarification on the teachings that I'm sharing with you today. So once again, welcome to all of you. I'm just gonna switch over to some slides just to kind of help you guys learn, give you some visual aids to understand what it is that we're gonna be sharing in terms of teachings. What we're gonna be doing over the next three classes is we're gonna be exploring this eightfold path. You can see it here where it goes from right view all the way to right concentration. This is the path to enlightenment. This is the way to train the mind in order to move it to this enlightened mental state. And it's really important to understand that everything that the Buddha taught is guidance in order to help you learn, reflect, and practice so that you can acquire wisdom. When you independently verify the teachings by not believing them, but independently verifying, that's when you gain wisdom. And by gaining that wisdom, now you'll make wiser and wiser choices in the world. And the reason why you've struggled and had difficulties in the world up to this point is that you didn't understand these natural laws of existence that the Buddha teaches. And by him sharing these teachings as guidance and helping you to understand the natural world around you, then by understanding that and independently verifying those teachings, you'll have the wisdom to make wiser and wiser decisions in your life. So the Buddhist teachings aren't believe a bunch of things, hope that you did that right, and then something beneficial happens once you die. Instead, it's learn now, don't believe, independently verify, acquire this wisdom. And as you train the mind, you see for yourself that the condition of the mind and the condition of your life is gradually improving. You see the discontent feelings like anger, sadness, and frustration and others gradually diminish as you train the mind more and more. So you will have the truth for yourself that these teachings are indeed working to help you and guide you to a improved state of mind and an improved life. And it's this eightfold path that's going to do that for you. But you have to do the work, of course. You have to be diligent in doing the work. So these three classes that I'm going to share over the next three Sundays, we're going to be discussing the wisdom section today, which is right view and right intention. Then we're going to be discussing the moral conduct, which is right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And then we're going to be doing mental discipline three Sundays from now, but it's really two weeks from now. We're going to be doing the mental discipline, which is right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So here you can see the schedule of doing those three three part classes that today is the 10th of April. Next week is the 17th of April. And then the following week is the 24th. And we'll be covering each of these aspects of the full path during that time. So as we share these teachings, I'm not interested in you believing anything that I share. I'm not interested in you believing anything that the Buddha shares, but in order to help you see what I'm sharing and what I'm teaching is what the Buddha taught, I will bring in the Buddha's words at different times to help you see what he actually taught. In this book series that I wrote, 
there's the words of the Buddha in here. This first book, which is what we use for the group learning program, you will see the Buddha's words in a table and it will have his words and then you'll see my words explaining it. I'm not interpreting his words. I'm not even really truly explaining it. I'm just kind of elaborating on it to help you understand what it is that he actually taught because the Buddha taught very straightforward. His words are very clear. He didn't teach in ways that you have to interpret or try to figure out what he was actually teaching. It just requires somebody to kind of guide you along the way. So in order for you to attain enlightenment, you would need a teacher to guide you, but you're on this independent journey doing all the work. So that's why I put the Buddha's words in this book, and I also put my words to further help you to understand what it is that the Buddha is sharing. So even right here in class today, when we talk about right view, I'm going to share with you what the words of the Buddha are related to right view. And one of the beauties about today's class is that if you understand right view and you can gain this understanding of right view, you will accomplish what the Buddha calls a breakthrough. Today, you can have this breakthrough if you're attentive and you ask questions where you need help and you really understand what it is that I'm sharing with you, not believing, but learn, reflect, and practice, you can have this breakthrough where today you're going to understand why your mind experiences all this discontentedness and then how to actually eliminate it. So what I'm going to be helping you with today is sharing the words of the Buddha and sharing the teachings, what is right view and right intention, but more importantly, helping you to be able to have this breakthrough and establish right view. Because without right view, you wouldn't actually be able to learn and build on top of that any other teachings that the Buddha shares. Everything that he shares in terms of his whole 45-year teaching career is built on right view. And that's why it's so important to work towards this breakthrough that you can accomplish today. So the first step of the Eightfold Path, the path to enlightenment, which is the core and central teaching of the Buddha, with everything else plugging into this core central teaching of the Eightfold Path, the Buddha explains in his own words what is right view. And he says, in what monks is right view? It is monks, the wisdom of discontentedness, the wisdom of the cause of discontentedness, the wisdom of the elimination of discontentedness, and the wisdom of the way of practice leading to the elimination of discontentedness. This is called right view. That's what he says in the Eightfold Path. What is right view? What he's essentially doing here is he's pointing towards this teaching that we call the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths is what we're going to be discussing as part of right view, because in order to have right view, you need to understand the Four Noble Truths. And that's what's going to allow you to have this breakthrough by understanding the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths is a much longer teaching than what I'm showing here. Underneath this line is the Buddha starting to teach the Four Noble Truths. And I just share this little bit with you to show you how the Eightfold Path is connecting with the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha in the Eightfold Path is pointing back to the Four Noble Truths and saying, this is right view. And then from that point, then a person needs to learn and deeply understand and practice the Four Noble Truths in order to establish right view. The Four Noble Truths is going to explain to you the problem, the cause of the problem, the elimination of the problem, and the way to eliminate the entire problem. And the problem we're talking about here is discontentedness. So in four simple statements, which the Buddha shares as part of his full teaching on the Four Noble Truths, he explains the problem of the unenlightened mind, he explains the cause, what's causing it, the elimination, and the way forward to completely eliminate it. It's called the Four Noble Truths because the Buddha knows that it's truth. I know it's the truth and other people know it's the truth. But in order for you to gain any benefit out of this teaching, you need to know that it's the truth. And that's why you can't believe what I'm sharing. You need to learn, reflect, and practice. And by you not believing and by you learning, reflecting, and practicing independently verifying the teachings, 
that's how you will understand that it's the truth. And when your mind comes to understand the truth and you've independently verified it and seen the truth for yourself, that's where your mind can become unshakable. The mind can be steady and unshakable that nobody can ever convince you anything different. When you look up at the sky and you see the sky is blue, nobody can ever convince you that the sky is green or that it's pink because you've seen it with your own eyes. Or if you grew up in a place where people taught you about Santa Claus and you know the truth for yourself that Santa Claus doesn't exist, nobody can ever convince you that Santa Claus exists. doesn't matter how many Christmas carols you hear on the radio. It doesn't matter how many Santa Claus you see in the mall. Nobody can convince you that Santa Claus exists because you know the truth. So by you understanding the truth of the Four Noble Truths, then you will understand the truth, your mind will be unshakable, and then you'll have this wisdom to now make better decisions in your life. So in order to understand the Four Noble Truths, you need to first understand what's called the Three Universal Truths. The Three Universal Truths are building blocks to help you understand and glean the benefit of the Four Noble Truths. So I'm first going to teach you the three universal truths as a way to lead into the four noble truths. And once again, they're called truths because the Buddha knows their truth. I know their truth. Other people know their truth, but you need to know their truth. So I'm going to go through these step by step. I'm going to share with you the teachings, helping you learn. Then I'm going to teach you how to reflect. And then I'm going to show you how to practice so you know this going forward. So let's take this first universal truth, impermanence. This first universal truth is essentially helping you to understand that everything is constantly changing, that there's no permanent state. Material objects, possessions, relationships, thoughts, ideas, states of mind, everything in the world's constantly changing. Essentially, you have these conditioned feelings in the mind that there's some feeling like sadness or happiness or excitement or boredom that arises it changes and then it fades away. This is called a conditioned feeling. These feelings are conditioned. They arise, they change, and then they fade away. And all things around us are impermanent except for enlightenment. Once somebody attains enlightenment, that is a permanent mental state. And these natural laws of existence that the Buddha taught are permanent. That's why what he taught 2,500 years ago is just as applicable today as it was back then because his teachings are timeless. He's explaining these natural laws that are exactly the same from during his life until now. But all these conditioned objects are impermanent. A conditioned object is something that arises, something that changes, and something that fades away. So this is the teaching of the universal truth of impermanence, that things are constantly changing. That's what I'm sharing with you as a teaching. You don't believe that. You've just learned it at this point. Now we're going to start reflecting. And the way you reflect is you start looking in the world. You start looking inward. You start trying to independently verify that this teaching is true. One of the ways to confirm whether it's true or not is try to disprove it. If you can find something in the world that is permanent, then this isn't a universal truth. So what you start doing is you start reflecting. You start thinking, okay, the Buddha is saying that everything's constantly changing. Is this physical body permanent? This physical body that you've inhabited now for however many years, has it been the same shape, the same size, the same weight your entire life, or has it been constantly changing? It's been constantly changing, right? What about your teeth? Are your teeth permanent? Have you had exactly the same teeth your whole life? No, you haven't. What about your hair? Is your hair permanent? Does it stay the same length, the same texture, the same color your whole life? Or has it been changing? It's been changing, right? Well, what about your relationships? Have you had exactly the same relationships in your life, your entire life? Or have people been coming and going in and out of your life at different times? People have been coming and going, right? Because of impermanence, the universal truth of impermanence. And what about your job? Have you had exactly the same job your entire life? Or have you tried different jobs and done different jobs at different times? Has your income been the same? Or has your income been going up and down at different times in your life? 
these are all changes. These are all impermanence. And the reason why these things continue to occur is because of the universal truth of impermanence. So this is the very first teaching that is important for you to understand. You've learned it. Now you start reflecting on it. And if you're not yet convinced for yourself through independent verification that, yes, the universal truth of impermanence is indeed a universal truth, then you start moving it into practice and you start going around the world and you start looking. Is the tree permanent? Does it continue to stay the same exact size? Are the leaves always on the tree? Are they always the same color? You walk down the street, you look at the sidewalk. Is the sidewalk the same shape, the same texture, the same color everywhere in your town? Or are there cracks in it? Is there different aspects of the sidewalk? What about a fence? When you paint a fence, does it stay exactly the same color all the time? You just paint it once and it's permanently there. So you can go through the world because this is a natural laws of existence and you can practice and you can look around you and you can see, are these things permanent or not? So this is how you learn, reflect and practice. This is the first universal truth, the universal truth of impermanence. Now we move on to the universal truth of discontentedness. This is what explains to you what the unenlightened mind experiences. The universal truth of discontentedness is explaining to you that your mind experiences three feelings. There's pleasant feelings, there's painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. Pleasant feelings are things like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria. These are all pleasant feelings that the mind experiences in the unenlightened state. Then there's these painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. All of these are painful feelings that the mind experiences. And then neither painful nor pleasant. This is like boredom, loneliness, melancholy, shyness, displeased, uncomfortable, unsatisfied. It's not painful, but it's not pleasant either. Now, I put boredom and loneliness in there, but some people tell me that boredom and loneliness is painful for them. So you could put boredom and loneliness in painful feelings if you like. But nonetheless, what the universal truth of discontentedness is explaining is that the unenlightened mind is going to experience these three feelings, pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. This is the mind, how it goes up and down at different times in your life. Now, you understand this from what I just shared, but you don't believe it, right? You just learned it. Now you start reflecting on it. And the way you reflect on it is you think about, okay, out of all the different feelings that I've experienced in my life, are there any feelings that I've experienced that aren't explained by one of these three? So do you have any feelings that you experience in life that doesn't fit into one of these three categories? So you can think about that. You can reflect on that. And then now you can start practicing that as you go through life, you can start observing how your mind is going to experience these pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. So a pleasant feeling might be where you get a new friend and you get all these excitement, you get happiness, you get thrilled, or you get a new job or a new car or a new pair of shoes or you know something wonderful that happens in your life. You get these conditioned, pleasant feelings. This pleasant feelings arise in the mind. And then there's these painful feelings. You know, maybe something happens that you don't like. Maybe you break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend, or maybe you lost your mobile phone, or you broke your mobile phone, or you lost your job. There's going to be these painful feelings of sadness, anger, frustration come into the mind. And then there's these neither painful nor pleasant feelings like shyness, where shyness, it isn't painful, but it's not pleasant either. Or another way to think about it is if you've ever been on a public transportation, you're from a culture where people don't really sit so close to each other and somebody comes and sits really, really close to you and maybe their body is even touching your body. It's not painful. 
it's not pleasant. It's like neither painful nor pleasant. You're kind of like uncomfortable or displeased or unsatisfied in that situation. That's what neither painful nor pleasant is. So these are the three feelings that the unenlightened mind is going to experience. And it's going to be based on some condition. I got a new friend. So happy, pleasant feelings. I got a new job. So happy, pleasant feelings. Oh, I lost my friend. I lost my boyfriend, girlfriend. Painful feelings. Oh, I lost my job. Painful feelings. And then there's these neither painful nor pleasant feelings that happen for various reasons throughout your day. Now, a lot of places that share the Buddhist teachings will describe this as suffering, but I don't use that word. The word suffering is meant to translate the original word that is in the original source text. The original source text of the Pali Canon, which is where the original source teachings of the Buddha reside, there the Buddha used the word dukkha. This word dukkha is often translated as suffering. And I don't use this word suffering because it really only captures the painful feelings. It doesn't explain the other three types of feelings. Because when you are happy, when you're excited, when you're elated, you probably wouldn't say you're suffering. Or when you felt shyness or that person comes and sits next to you on the bus really close or on the train really close or something like that, you wouldn't say you were suffering when they were sitting next to you. But the mind was discontent, discontented, or you were experiencing discontentedness. This is why I use this word because it fully captures what the Buddha was talking about when he was discussing dukkha and he was describing a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, and a feeling that's neither painful nor pleasant. He was describing this discontentedness, this discontent feelings that arise in the mind. Whereas if we use the word suffering, we're only capturing 33% of what the Buddha was talking about, which is the painful feelings. That means we're missing 66% of what the Buddha was discussing. And that's a huge amount of misunderstanding to have in terms of what the Buddha was teaching. So if we're missing 66% and not understanding 66% of what the Buddha was sharing, then we're, we're really losing out on his wisdom and his insight. So that's why I use the word discontent, discontented or discontentedness. You've experienced happiness before. This is conditioned happiness. But what you're moving the mind to with enlightenment is this unconditioned joy. Or you might want to think of it as unconditioned happiness, where there's no condition that needs to create this joy in the mind. Where right now, your mind needs a new job, a new pair of shoes, a new friend, or something like this to create perhaps these pleasant feelings to come into the mind. But an enlightened being, their mind is always joyful. When they wake up all day long and when they go to bed, their mind is always joyful. Never experience a grumpiness or a bad mood or anything like that because they've removed the pollution of mind that is causing the mind to base its inner feelings on these conditions. And this is what we're going to talk about in the Four Noble Truths. But for now, just understand that the universal truth of discontentedness is explaining that the unenlightened mind is going to have these three feelings of pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. And if you can discover one feeling that doesn't fit into one of those three categories, then that means this isn't a universal truth. And that's how you independently verify whether this is true or not. Now, the third universal truth is called the universal truth of non-self. This tends to be a bit more of an intermediate to advanced teaching, but I'm going to introduce it to you here. And then later in the program, when we get to chapter 16, we're really going to explore it and go much deeper into it at that point. But here, I'm just going to introduce it to you to help you understand it, because it oftentimes takes many conversations to be able to understand it and start practicing it. But here, introducing it to you will be really helpful for you. So the universal truth of non-self is the Buddha sharing that there is no self, that this physical body nor this mind is who you are as a person. The unenlightened mind will oftentimes project a certain self-image in terms of the physical body. 
and have certain self-identity in the mind that it thinks this is who you are as a person. And because of this, the mind gets shaken up. Whereas if somebody says something agreeable about your physical appearance, then your mind has these conditioned pleasant feelings. You get happy, you get excited, you get elated. But it's only a matter of time before somebody comes along and says something disagreeable to you about your self-image, your physical appearance. So if your self-image is now being degraded or somebody's talking negative about your self-image, you're going to experience sadness or anger or frustration because the unenlightened mind thinks this body is who you are as a person. And now all it takes is someone to say something agreeable, these pleasant feelings arise, or somebody says something disagreeable, and these painful feelings arise. And as long as the mind thinks and falsely believes and has this misunderstanding that this physical body is who you are as a person, it will continue to get shaken up whenever you hear agreeable or disagreeable things about this self-image. And likewise, the self-identity that we hold on into the mind. There are certain things that you might identify with that maybe, like for me, maybe some of you might think that I am a Buddhist teacher. I live in Thailand. I am a father. I am an American, right? If you identify with these things as I am, I am a Buddhist teacher. Well, if perhaps somebody hears somebody talking about pleasant things and agreeable things about Buddhist teacher, they will get pleasant feelings. But if somebody is degrading Buddhist teachers and talking negatively about Buddhist teachers, now that person's going to experience painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration. But the mind needs to realize that while you may perform the role of a Buddhist teacher, I am not a Buddhist teacher in terms of the identity in the mind. That's not who I am. It's not permanent. Likewise, this idea of I am an American. Well, this physical body was born in America. But if I adopt the thinking that I am an American and I hold on to that really tightly, well, when somebody says something agreeable about Americans, then the mind gets these pleasant feelings. But it's only a matter of time before somebody says something disagreeable about an American. And then that person's going to then have their mind shaken up, experiencing anger, frustration, or some other discontent feeling. So the Buddha is teaching you as part of the universal truth of non-self to let this go and realize that this physical body and this mind is not you. It's not who you are, that there is no permanent self. And there are certain techniques and certain ways to train the mind to let that go. It's one thing to hear me say this and teach you this and you learn it as a teaching. It's another thing to train the mind to actually do it. Now, the way that you can observe this and independently verify that there is no permanent self is through your reflection. Start reflecting. Think about how you viewed yourself when you were a child or in early adulthood and then now. Your image of yourself and who you thought you are as a person has been constantly changing and constantly evolving, hasn't it? So you kind of looked at yourself and your self-image in one way when you were a child, early adulthood and now adulthood, and that's been constantly changing over the course of your life. This is because there is no self. So that's been constantly changing. Another way you can reflect on this is you can take your finger and I can say, okay, point to yourself. You know, where is Jan? Where is Chris? You know, where is Parikashit? Where is Nick? Where is Chrissy? Where is Marcy? And oftentimes people will point to either the physical body or they will point to the head, which is where a lot of people think that the mind is. Well, if you point to the physical body and you say, this is David, it's like, okay, well, that's just a shirt. That's not David. The shirt isn't David. So if we take off the shirt and we say, well, where's David? And you point again, it's like, well, that's not David. That's just skin, just pointing to skin. So we take off the skin. Well, where's David? And then point again. Well, that's just bones. That's just the rib cage and some tissue, right? Some muscle tissue. So we take that out. All that's there is organs and fluid and tissue and bones and skin. That's not David. 
that's not who David is. This is just a physical body. So here you can independently verify, you can start reflecting and see that there is no self, that the universal truth of non-self is the truth. But it's a little bit harder for people to see the clarity of that and see the truth in that because our mind gets wrapped up in these labels of we get this name David at birth and now there's this self-image and self-identity that gets wrapped around this label of David. And we start identifying with this label of David. And now we go around and we start to adopt this thinking that I am David. But in reality, we just got this label at birth because what we've got here is we've got this big bag of skin with bones and fluid and things like this. But my grandmother couldn't ask my mom, you know, is that big bag of skin come on from school yet? You know, they couldn't do that. They had to say, you know, has David come on from school yet? Or is David doing his homework? You know, so we needed to know who this being is. So we got these labels and these names. So the problem is, is that the unenlightened mind starts falsely identifying, mistakenly believing and misunderstanding that this body is who we are as a person or this mind is who we are as a person. And the Buddha is teaching us that that's not the truth, that the real truth is that there is no self and we can train the mind to let go of this self-image and self-identity. And then the mind will reside more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy as you train the mind to let that go. Rather than allowing the mind to get shaken up, every time you hear something agreeable or disagreeable about the self-image or self-identity. So I'm going to pause here and see what questions you guys have about the three universal truths before we move into talking and discussing the four noble truths. The way that you ask questions is you put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Our moderators will see that. Or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions or follow-up questions that you like. Hello, Kishore. Here you mentioned a enlightenment and then you mentioned happiness as a pleasant feeling, which is the discontentedness. So the question is, aren't enlightenment and happiness the same thing, which is the goal for our life? So a lot of people describe enlightenment as happiness or ultimate bliss or ultimate happiness. I typically don't describe it that way because you've experienced happiness. You know what happiness feels like. And when you experience happiness, it was temporary. It arose, it changed, and it faded away. Enlightenment and this mental state of enlightenment, once you attain it, it's permanent. Your mind will no longer experience this up and down, up and down. The mind is permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So since we know what happiness is, that it arises, changes, and fades away, and I'm describing for you that enlightenment is permanent, then we know that enlightenment is not happiness. But this happiness that is experienced in the unenlightened state, it's conditioned happiness. There's some condition that's causing the happiness. My children came home with a good report card. I'm happy right? Or I bought a new house. I'm happy. I got a new mobile phone. I'm happy. There's these conditions that are creating the happiness. But an enlightened mind isn't going to experience this conditional happiness. It's going to be permanently joyful. So with an unenlightened mind, if it's sunny outside, you might be happy. If it rains, you might be sad. But an enlightened mind, it's sunny outside, joy, lots of joy. If it's raining outside, joy, lots of joy. The mind can still be joyful. So if you'd like to think about enlightenment as unconditioned happiness, you can think of it that way. But I tend to think of it as something different than happiness is as joy. And this will really help you to understand that this enlightened mind is going to experience joy when you wake up, all day long and when you go to sleep, the mind's just going to always be joyful. It's not going to lose the happiness, which is what you're experiencing now, is that you'll have this temporary happiness and then it's gone. So enlightenment is a permanent mental state where you're going to always be experiencing peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy without anything being able to shake up your mind whatsoever. So how can we 
keep or maintain the material objects or possessions, relationships permanently. You can't keep material possessions and objects permanently. That's impossible because those things are impermanent. So like this mug that I was just drinking out of, it arose out of different things coming together like clay and paint and different things, a certain process. It arose and now it changes over time. The color changes. I might get a chip in it, something like that. It's changing. And then at some point it will fade away. It will break. It will fall apart. It will something will happen and this mug will no longer exist. So this physical possession is impermanent. Even if it's still around by the time I die, I'm not going to be able to keep this mug permanently because it's impermanent, right? So it's important to understand that all these different objects around you are impermanent. Thanks, sir. Let's go to Marcy. Thank you, Balsam. Thank you, Teacher David. Um, I'm just looking for a little bit of uh, clarity. Um, you speak of the three universal truths, and then you speak of the natural laws of existence. Is each one of the three universal truths a natural law of existence? Yes. You can think of the natural laws of existence as all the Buddhist teachings, because there's these natural laws of existence that are out in the world that the unenlightened mind is unaware of. It has this unknowing of true reality. It doesn't understand these natural laws. What the Buddha is doing in his teachings is he's describing these natural laws. So these natural laws exist whether the Buddha existed or not. The Buddha arose 2,500 years ago, but even before he existed, these natural laws of existence were existing. And after his death, these natural laws still exist. When he came about and he got to enlightenment, his teachings are describing these natural laws so that people can actually understand them. It's just like the natural law of gravity. You know, when human beings first came onto this earth and they started existing, the natural law of gravity existed, but people didn't understand it. All they understood is that when they picked up something, something fell. They didn't understand that there's such thing as a natural law of gravity. But at some point in our human history, somebody came along and they wrote out a mathematic equation and they explained the natural law of gravity so that everybody could understand it. So that person, whoever that was, described the natural law of gravity. So what the Buddha did is he described the natural laws of existence in a way that others could understand them because as his mind awoke on his own to enlightenment, he understood these natural laws of existence more clearly than anyone else because he was an actual Buddha. And then he was able to articulate and put into words through his teachings what these natural laws are and describing them. Thank you, Teacher David. You're welcome. Let's go to Nick for Facebook questions. Thank you, Boston. Hello, Teacher David. Good evening to you, Venerable Sir. Good evening. We have a question on Facebook from Sandra. She asks, what's the difference between enlightenment and bliss? So when the mind is moving towards enlightenment, there's these four jhanas or preliminary phases that the mind will experience before it gets to the first stage of enlightenment. And then there's four stages of enlightenment. So there's these four preliminary phases. These are temporary. The mind can actually regress out of those. And then there's these four stages of enlightenment that the mind goes through. And once you get to the first stage, the mind will no longer regress backwards. It'll just continue forward from there. When a practitioner starts putting together the Eightfold Path and a lot of these other teachings, the mind will move into this first jhana, this first preliminary phase that the mind will experience. When the mind gets there, it becomes very blissful you'll have this overwhelming bliss, but it's temporary. It's not permanent. You'll experience it for extended periods of time, but it is impermanent. It won't last. So it's this overwhelming bliss, this overwhelming happiness, this euphoria, this exhilaration, this thrill, and the mind can actually regress out of that. A lot of times people who experience that first jhana They think that they're actually enlightened because they don't understand the four jhanas and then the four stages of enlightenment. So oftentimes when people experience that first jhana, it's such night and day between being off the path 
to being in that first jhana that people oftentimes mistakenly think that because of that bliss that they're actually experiencing enlightenment. But the mental state in the first jhana, it's not permanent yet. The mind still goes up and down, but just not as much. It's a little bit more tempered. So if you understand this, then when you experience that first jhana and the bliss in that first jhana, you know it's temporary. You know your mind can regress. You don't get this overwhelming attachment to that feeling so that you can just continue to progress forward, making your way through those four jhanas and then get into the first stage of enlightenment and beyond because that's where the mind won't regress. So the bliss is still conditional where once you get to enlightenment, the joy that you experience in enlightenment, it's unconditioned. It's kind of like the way that I explain this is if you know what conditional love is, which isn't really love, but if somebody said, I will love you if you meet all my expectations, here's my conditions. If you meet this condition, this condition, this condition, this condition, I will love you. But if you stop meeting those conditions, I won't love you anymore. This isn't real love, but we'll just call it conditional love. You're probably not interested in that. That's kind of like bargaining, right? That's kind of like a contract. Like you meet my conditions and I'll love you, but if you stop, then I won't love you anymore. But then there's this unconditional love, which is actually true love. This is real love where somebody just loves you regardless. If you're having a good day, a bad day, a so-so day, they love you regardless. Your hair is long, your hair is short. You have two arms, you have one arm. This person loves you regardless, right? It's unconditional love. So the bliss that someone experiences in the first jhana, that's conditional happiness, conditional excitement, conditional exhilaration and euphoria. The joy that you experience in enlightenment, it's unconditional. It's just always there. So, Allah's Kuhaz is on Dresden. That's a good name. Um, my question is about love. Uh, it was a great segue to the last part. Does love fit into discontentedness as a pleasant feeling or even as a painful feeling? Love is a mental state more than a feeling. We oftentimes misunderstand craving, desire, attachment, which is what we're going to talk about next. In the unenlightened state, we think craving, desire, attachment is love. And we think about it as a feeling because it arises, it changes, and it fades away. But that's not actually real love. These conditional feelings of discontentedness, they arise, they change, and they fade away. So oftentimes people mistakenly understand that what they're describing as love is love. But you're going to understand when we get to chapter 15 in this program what true love is. True love actually doesn't arise, it doesn't change, and it doesn't fade away. It's just always there. That's called unconditional love or true love. What people are thinking is love is actually craving, desire, attachment. But we'll talk about that more when we get to chapter 15 in the book. Thank you. You're welcome. So love is a mental state as opposed to a feeling. Let's go back to Marcy. Thank you again, Bassam. Thank you, Teacher David. Um, just real quick, the jhanas you had spoken, and if this is something that you want to discuss later on, that's fine, but I just want to pose this question. You said jhanas are something that you have. It's a temporary bliss that you can come in and out of those areas. Um, but the four stages of enlightenment, once you reach those stages, that's a permanent step. Do you not fall back out of those? That's correct. You can't regress out of the first, second, third, or fourth stage of enlightenment. Once you attain one of those, the mind won't regress. But in those four preliminary phases that the mind goes through called the jhanas, the mind can regress out of those. And that's why it's important that you don't get hung up and bogged down in the jhanas thinking that the mind is actually enlightened because If somebody walks around thinking they're enlightened, there's this arrogance, this pride, this conceit that comes into the mind, and the mind will actually regress out of those jhanas. This is a very common occurrence for someone who's not aware and who isn't receiving guidance that they'll experience those jhanas a little bit and then their mind will regress out of it. So once you get to the first stage of enlightenment, the mind won't regress backwards from there. It's only going to go forward. Well, so as for the third universal truth, uh, if I am not this body, this physical body, or this mind, 
how can I maintain peace and uh, calm in the mind if someone is talking badly or harshly about my physical body or my mind? That's where the training comes in. And that's what we're going to be discussing as part of this eightfold path is how to train the mind to let that stuff go. And today we're going to be explaining why the mind experiences discontentedness and then how to eliminate it. So we're going to be talking about the cause and the elimination, but then how to actually train it to eliminate it long term is what you're going to get throughout the entire program. Thanks, sir. No more questions. All right. Well, let's understand what craving desire attachment is. This is important as one more building block. And then we're going to talk about the Four Noble Truths. Oftentimes, this word craving or desire is used in common language in different way than what we discuss it as as part of these teachings. So in order to understand the Four Noble Truths and have this breakthrough and understand what the Buddha has to share with you, you need to understand how we use this word craving, desire, attachment, also expectations, wants, holding, grasping, or clinging is part of the Buddhist teachings. Because oftentimes, if you think about craving, you might think like, I'm craving ice cream or I'm craving chocolate cake. But that's not what we're talking about when we discuss it as part of the Buddha's teachings. When we talk about craving, desire, attachment, what we're describing is a mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. The mind is pulling towards the direction of the objects of its affection. The mind has this longing or this yearning, this wanting something. It's like the next new shiny object around the corner. The mind thinks that this is what's going to fulfill you. So if you've ever had a new pair of shoes or a new phone came out on the market or a new purse or a new car and your mind just felt like, gosh, I just got to have that so badly. That's craving, desire, attachment. That's the mental longing for something with a strong eagerness, the mind pulling in the direction of the objects of its affection. And these are also expectations or wants or holding or grasping or clinging where the mind is longing and yearning for something. So is there any questions on this particular word? Because next I'm going to move into the Four Noble Truths and start explaining to you what those are. And you'll need this understanding of what a craving, desire, attachment is, where the mind's pulling toward the objects of its affection. Some people think that craving and desire is a motivation for life or for success. Do you agree with this? It can motivate people, but it doesn't need to motivate people. As long as you're operating through craving, you're going to see that it's going to cause you problems. It's going to cause you significant problems in your life. You can actually be more successful without this craving, desire, attachment, because then you'll be doing things in the middle way. Rather than yearning and longing and producing all these unwholesome decisions based on the mind longing and yearning for something, instead you can practice what's called the middle way. The Buddha taught the middle way. Essentially what the middle way is, is it's like an instrument. If you had a stringed instrument and the string was too tight and you plucked the string, it wouldn't play beautiful music. It'd be like ping. But also if the instrument was too loose and you plucked the string, it wouldn't play beautiful music. It wouldn't play the way that the instrument was intended to play. And essentially, the unenlightened mind is doing exactly that. It's holding on and craving. It's also too loose in certain situations. The mind isn't performing optimally the way that it was intended to play. But when you tune this instrument perfectly in the middle and you pluck the string, it plays beautiful music the way that the instrument was intended to play. And your mind is exactly the same way that when it's tuned perfectly to the middle and it's optimized, then it's going to play beautiful music. You're going to be able to function in life with ease and with peacefulness. As long as there's craving there, you might think that that's beneficial to you now. But when you gain the wisdom to understand the harm that it's causing you and it's causing other people, then you can see that actually you can eliminate craving and your life will be much better. Thanks, sir. No more questions. All right. So let's talk about the Four Noble Truths. And I'm going to go through each one of these a few times, give you some examples and help you do that learning, reflection and practice. So the first noble truth is everyone that is unenlightened will experience discontentedness. Okay, so this is describing the problem that everyone who's currently unenlightened, the mind 
is going to experience those conditioned pleasant feelings, those conditioned painful feelings, and those conditioned feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. The mind's going to bounce around, going up and down. There will be periods of time where the mind will be peaceful, but it's only a matter of time before the mind gets shaken up and it feels one of these discontent feelings because the mind is untrained, it's unenlightened. You haven't done anything wrong. There's lots of unenlightened beings in the world. The goal is to move the mind to enlightenment. But this first noble truth is everyone that is unenlightened will experience discontentedness. So if you're experiencing those conditioned feelings that we talked about, then you know that your mind is currently unenlightened. What you need to do is you need to actively train the mind in order to move it to this enlightened mental state where it can be permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, and that will eliminate the discontentedness. But the problem is discontentedness. All unenlightened beings are going to experience that. The second noble truth is discontentedness is caused by our own cravings, desires, attachments, because the mind wants everything to be permanent when everything in the world is impermanent. Now, I'm going to say that a few times, and I'm going to give you some examples and walk you through this. So discontentedness is caused by our own craving, desires, attachments. Discontentedness is caused by the mental longing and yearning, the wanting, the chasing after the objects of your affection, the mind pulling in the direction of the objects of its affection. Because the mind wants everything to be permanent when everything in the world is impermanent. So the mind craves permanence. Another way to say this is the unenlightened mind does not like impermanence. It doesn't like change. It gets shaken up because it doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. The mind is unawakened. It doesn't have this wisdom of the universal truth of impermanence. So it craves and craves and yearns and longs and tries to hold on to things permanently. And when it can't get the objects of its affection, when it can't hold on to things permanently, that's when the mind gets shaken up. So let me give you some examples. If you've ever been in a relationship, like a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, and wife, when you guys first got together, things were really enjoyable. They were so pleasant. You were having those conditioned, pleasant feelings of happiness, excitement, elation, because you've got this new person. They're taking an interest in you. They are interested in spending time with you. And wow, you just feel so great. And so do they. But then at some point, there were these expectations and these cravings, these desires, this mental longing from you and from them where things started to become discontent in the relationship. There was anger. There was sadness. There might have been some arguing, some frustration that was going on in the relationship. And then you guys separated. And then you were either angry or sad. You might have been lonely or bored during that time. The mind was experiencing this discontentedness. The reason why is because your mind was craving and holding on to this person, wanting this relationship to be permanent. Now, during the relationship and when the relationship ends, we oftentimes blame the other person. We think the other person is who's causing our anger or our sadness or our loneliness or our boredom. But actually, what you can understand here, if you learn this really close and you have this breakthrough is that you actually cause the discontentedness yourself. We're not talking about the breakup and why the breakup occurred. We're talking about why was the mind sad? Why was it angry? Why was it bored? Why was it lonely? This is because the mind was trying to hold on to this relationship permanently. It wanted this relationship to be permanent. It didn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. So when the relationship ended, And all this change was happening in your life. The mind didn't like that. It didn't like that impermanence because it didn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. Another example, let's say you bought a brand new shiny sports car and now you've got all these pleasant feelings because you got this brand new shiny sports car and now you drive it and you park it at a store. You go into the store and you come out and there's this scratch on the car. 
you see that scratch and you get angry, you get frustrated, you get irritated, you might even be ready to fight somebody, right? This is because the mind is craving permanence. It wanted that sports car to be shiny red sports car always. And when it saw this scratch, when it saw this impermanence, the mind didn't like that because it didn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. And now when it sees this scratch, this change, that's when this anger arises or this sadness arises because somebody else could come out of the store, see that scratch and say, hmm, I've got a scratch on the car. Thank goodness I've got insurance. Let me go get it fixed, take it down to the shop and get it fixed. Once again, we're not talking about what's right or wrong because it would be wonderful if this car never got any scratches. It would be perfect if nobody ever brushed up against the car, there was no shopping cart that scratched the car. If that never happened, that would be wonderful. But the fact is, is that there's this universal truth of impermanence, this truth that this car cannot stay permanently looking beautiful. And it's when your mind is craving the permanence that when it sees the scratch, that's when it gets angry because it's seeing this disagreeable thing and it doesn't like this change. It doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. If it was the scratch that was causing the anger or sadness, then that means every single person who sees the scratch would get angry. But not every single person gets angry when they see a scratch on their car. Because some people see the scratch and they understand the universal truth of impermanence. And they say, hmm, thank goodness I've got insurance. Let me go get this scratch fixed. But other person might get enraged or so angry. There's been people that have been murdered over scratches on the car. And now that person goes away to jail and has ruined their entire life just because they didn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. They didn't understand it was craving desire attachment, craving permanence. And because their mind was craving permanence, they got so angry, they've actually murdered people now, right? We see that in the world, right? So the cause of discontentedness, the second noble truth, is the cause of your discontentedness is the craving desire attachment. The mind is longing and yearning, wanting things to be permanent. Now that's the learning, okay? Now start doing the reflection. What you can do is you can look back over your life in any situation where you experience discontentedness, where in the past you might have thought that somebody else caused your discontentedness. Now look at those same experiences and look at your own mind. What were you craving? There was some craving, you something you wanted to be permanent. And then there was change involved. There was some impermanence and your mind didn't like it. And that's when the discontentedness arose. And if you can go through your life and see that through reflection, piece by piece by piece, you can independently verify this teaching that it's true. And then in terms of practice going forward, now, throughout your life, each day, each week, each month, whenever your mind experiences discontentedness, rather than blame other people and think that another person or the situation is causing your discontentedness, because that's what the unenlightened mind wants to do. It has wrong view. The unenlightened mind wants to blame other people. It wants to say that somebody else is causing you to be angry. But if you can have this breakthrough and you can understand right view, then from now going forward, whenever your mind is experiencing discontentedness, you can sit down and you can look and you can observe what is the craving desire attachment that's causing this discontentedness. It's something that's in your mind that your mind is craving and desiring. You're wanting permanence. And if you can start doing that, then you can start getting a handle on this. Because if it's everybody else that's causing your discontentedness, then that means in order to get to peace, you've got to go around and train 7.5 billion people in the world to do things your way because everybody's doing things the wrong way. They're not doing things your way. So if everybody just does things your way, then you can be peaceful, right? That's what the unenlightened mind thinks. So oftentimes in the unenlightened state, we go around trying to fix everybody else. We try to get everybody else to do things our way. And we think that that's going to fix the problem. 
but it doesn't because you can't train 7.5 billion people to do things your way. And there's new people being born all the time. So you're going to have to roll out this extensive training program to train everybody in the world to do things your way or else you're going to always be discontent. So you can either train 7.5 billion people plus all the new people being born every day or you can just train one mind. And if you train one mind to understand these natural laws of existence, you can liberate the mind. You can get to freedom. But you have to independently verify the teachings and not have wrong view. Wrong view would be everyone else is causing your discontentedness. Right view would be to understand and realize that you're causing it yourself. Again, you're not a bad person. You just lack the wisdom. You haven't had the training to understand these natural laws of existence. And you haven't trained the mind to let go and no longer crave permanence. So even though you might understand and you might starting to have this breakthrough to establish right view today, you're not going to be able to go and completely transform your mind in the snap of a finger. It doesn't happen that way. You have to gradually train the mind to understand all these natural laws of existence. Because the third noble truth, in order to eliminate this discontentedness, you need to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. If you can transform the mind and eliminate this pollution where the mind wants everything to be permanent, it has this mental longing and strong eagerness chasing after the objects of your affection. If you can eliminate that from the mind through training, now you can bring it to the middle where it performs optimally, where you can do certain things in your day, you can work towards certain goals, but without this yearning and longing and wanting and I've got to have that right now mentality because that's going to just continue to cause discontentedness. So the Buddhist teachings are going to train the mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment because that's the solution. And the fourth noble truth is the complete solution. This is how you completely eliminate all discontentedness from the mind is by practicing the Eightfold Path. The path to eliminating discontentedness is the Eightfold Path. That's the complete and perfect training plan for your mind, not for others, but to liberate your mind from the discontentedness so you can eliminate the strong feelings that keep coming up in the mind and producing the mind where it's being shaken up all the time. So in these four simple statements, the first noble truth is explaining the problem that everyone that is unenlightened will experience discontentedness. The second noble truth is explaining the cause. Discontentedness is caused by our own cravings, desires, attachments, this mental longing and strong eagerness, because the mind wants everything to be permanent when everything in the world is impermanent. The third noble truth explains the elimination of discontentedness is possible by eliminating craving, desire, attachment. Since craving, desire, attachment is the cause, we just need to eliminate that through training the mind and that will eliminate discontentedness. And the fourth noble truth is saying the way to eliminate craving, desire, attachment is this path using the Eightfold Path. That's the path to eliminating discontentedness, which is the Eightfold Path. And that's what we're going to be talking about over these next three sessions is helping you to deeply understand this Eightfold Path And then in your life, you'll just need to gradually ramp that up where you're gradually training the mind, you're gradually practicing the teachings, and then you'll gradually see these results where discontentedness will gradually diminish. And eventually, once you attain enlightenment, it will be completely eliminated from the mind. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys have on the Four Noble Truths. You can ask those by putting them into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom. As for the second noble truth, uh, it seems that in some situations, people who are around us are uh, uh, treating us in a certain way, in a wrong way. And even if we try to tell them many, many, many times to uh, deal in the correct way, in the right way, they insist on what they are doing. By this, they are causing us discontentedness, right? The problem isn't that 
people are doing certain things, the problem is that your mind wants them to be doing something different. So if somebody's doing a certain thing, your mind wants them to be doing something different than that. That's the problem. If somebody's disrespectful to you, okay, we're not talking about what's right or wrong here because it would be right for them to be respectful to you. It would be right for that to occur. But because of the universal truth of impermanence, is it possible for 100% of the people in the world to be respectful to you? If you understand the universal truth of impermanence, then you know it's not possible for 100% of the people to be respectful to you. It's not possible. But if your mind's craving, yearning, wanting this permanence for 100% of the people to be respectful to you, that's where your mind's causing its discontentedness because you misunderstand these natural laws of existence. You don't understand the universal truth of impermanence, so your mind's sitting there craving for 100% of the people to respect you. So when someone's disrespectful, we're not talking about whether they're right or wrong because, again, they'd be right to respect you, but the universal truth of impermanence tells us it's impossible for that to occur. So as long as your mind is craving for 100% of the people to respect you, you're going to be discontent because there's going to be situations where people don't respect you. And that's just the way it is because of the universal truth of impermanence. So the more you crave permanence, the more you crave for people to respect you, the more discontent your mind's going to be. But then that's also where you get to make choices in your life of who you choose to spend time with. But be clear that if your mind experiences anger or frustration or irritation or annoyance in a situation where someone's disrespectful, that person hasn't caused your discontentedness. You're causing it yourself because of the craving desire attachment, wanting 100% of the people to permanently respect you. Well, if I still have some difficult situations in, in uh, some personal or professional uh, relationships in my daily life, uh, can I contact you after the class to uh, help me? Yes, that's part of what I do is provide people personal guidance. You can ask questions through the Facebook group, through asking questions here online. You can send a private message or you can schedule a personal guidance session and I will help you to be able to see more and more clearly how your mind is causing itself to be discontent because that's what you can change. You can change your mind, but you can't change the mind of somebody else. So if you go around and try to teach everyone to respect you, that's an impossible feat. You can't accomplish that because again, there's 7.5 billion people in the world, but you can train your mind to understand impermanence and understand how to now navigate the world through these natural laws of existence. The reason why your mind keeps getting shaken up and having difficulties and struggling is because it doesn't understand these natural laws of existence and it's a real difficult struggle and it's extremely difficult to exist in a world that you don't understand. So if you keep existing in a world that you don't understand the natural laws, then your mind's going to keep getting shaken up over and over again. So if somebody would like personal guidance outside of class, they're more than welcome to contact me and I'll help them to see that more and more clearly. Many thanks. No more questions for now. All right. So let's move on and discuss right intention, which is the second step of the Eightfold Path. This first step of right view is really important. You need to establish right view more and more deeply. You know, you can have this breakthrough in class, but now you need to go through your daily life and start realizing that whenever your mind is experiencing discontentedness, always look within to understand what it is. And also when other people's minds are discontent, they're causing it themselves too. So if people go around blaming you for making them angry, it's impossible for you to make them angry. They don't know that, and it's not your job to teach them that, but you can rest assured if somebody else is angry, you're not causing it. So you're causing all your own discontent feelings. So one of the other ways to understand the Four Noble Truths and Right View is taking responsibility for all of your discontentedness, taking responsibility for your own emotions. As long as you continue to blame other people for your emotions, 
you're not looking at the right place. And that's why you can't solve the problem if you blame other people for the emotions and feelings that you experience. But when you look inward and you understand that you're causing all your own feelings and all your own emotions, then you can get to the root cause and you can actually solve it. One of the beauties of understanding the Four Noble Truths and right view is that if you can accept responsibility and you can see very clearly with this breakthrough that you're causing all of your discontentedness, then you can take responsibility for it and you can eliminate it. That's why you can attain enlightenment. Other people can't give you enlightenment. You have to be able to see the wisdom and train the mind yourself. And by you training the mind through this eightfold path, by accepting responsibility for your emotions as part of right view, now you can actually train the mind and actually attain enlightenment. And the next part of that is to understand right intention. Right intention or right thinking or right thought. This is the second step of the full path. And the Buddha says here very clearly, in what monks is right intention? It's the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, the intention of harmlessness. This monks is called right intention. So there's three aspects to right intention where the mind has to have the right thought or the right thinking or the right intention of one renunciation. What renunciation is, is the interest or willingness to let go, to give up unwholesomeness of the mind, letting go of any false beliefs or false perceptions of reality or misunderstandings. You need to be willing to let this go. If you're currently experiencing discontentedness, then you know your mind is unenlightened. So therefore, you haven't yet experienced what the Buddha calls final knowledge. When you experience final knowledge, the mind is enlightened. You understand the truth at that point. You've gone through and evaluated and independently verified all the natural laws of existence. You've trained your mind to the point where it's now peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. You're experiencing final knowledge. You know the truth and your mind is unshakable that you've independently verified the teachings. So therefore, your mind is no longer going to be shaken up. So if your mind is currently unenlightened, you know you haven't experienced final knowledge, you haven't yet gotten to the truth. You don't yet know the truth about certain things. Your mind hasn't yet accomplished the wisdom of the natural laws of existence. So you have to be willing here as part of the second step of the Eightfold Path to have this intention or this thinking or this thought, this willingness, this interest to let go. Because there are certain things that you believe, there are certain opinions that you have right now that are false beliefs, they're false perceptions. And as long as you hold on to these things, then you're not going to be able to get to final knowledge. You're not going to be able to experience enlightenment because your mind's still holding on to false truths. They're not actually truths. So as part of renunciation, the mind has to be willing to relinquish or let go or give up the unwholesomeness in the mind, including certain false beliefs and certain false perceptions. This is why you need to independently verify the teachings to get to wisdom. Because with belief, you don't know if it's true or false. That's why the mind can be shaken up with belief. But when you've independently verified the teachings and you see the truth and you've acquired wisdom, you saw the truth with your own eyes. Your mind can't be shaken up you know the truth. So if your mind is currently experiencing discontentedness, there's certain things you're going to have to let go of and there's certain new things you're going to have to learn in order to train the mind and get it to this enlightened mental state. The second part of right intention is the intention of non-ill will. The intention of non-ill will is essentially like saying having the intention of good will. Because non-ill will is two negatives, right? Two negatives is a positive. Non-ill will is goodwill or loving kindness. Because what ill will is, is ill will is like animosity, bitterness, anger, hatred, and all these lesser versions. As long as the mind has this ill will, this bitterness, this animosity towards other beings, you're not going to be able to get to the point where you experience enlightenment. So you've got to gradually train the mind to let go of ill will, 
practicing goodwill, this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. This is loving kindness. And if you can gradually move the mind towards that, which is what the Buddhist teachings are going to help you do through meditation and through some other training, you're going to gradually be able to let go of this animosity, this bitterness, this resentfulness, this hatred, this anger, this frustration, this annoyance that the mind has towards other people. Instead, you can bring the mind into this loving kindness where you have goodwill, this active goodwill, where you have the genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. That's the intention that you need to move into this practice with and then cultivate that more and more as you go forward. And then the third aspect of this is the intention of harmlessness. Harmlessness is to not cause or be incapable of causing harm to others. Because everything that the Buddha taught in terms of the natural laws of existence is based on what's called the natural law of gamma. You might have heard the word karma. This is the Sanskrit version. The natural law of gamma. Gamma is the Pali language, and that's the original source language of the Buddhist teachings. So people who study the original source teachings will use this word gamma. Gamma or karma is oftentimes thought as, as punishment and rewards, but it's not punishment and rewards. It's cause and effect or action and result. It's the results of your decisions. Essentially, if you're polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, you're going to have lots of friends because people are going to enjoy being around you. Whereas if you're impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful to people, you're going to have a real trouble in your relationships. And that's the natural law of gamma. There's no being that's overseeing this. There's nobody that's dishing out punishment and rewards. It's just the results of your decisions. And when you decide to be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, you're going to see that your relationships will blossom, both personally and professionally. And if you're impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful, you'll see that your relationships will struggle. This is just the results of your decisions. Cause and effect or action and result. The natural law of gamma. So in this natural laws of existence, this natural law of gamma, of cause and effect, if you put out harm into the world, that harm is going to come back to you. So here in the second step of the Eightfold Path, you need to more and more cultivate the intention of harmlessness, not being interested or being incapable of causing harm to others. Because the more the mind continues to harbor this ill will, and practice harmfulness where you are harmful to others, then that harm you put out is going to come back to you. In the rest of the Eightfold Path, the Buddha is going to teach you how to train the mind to cultivate these things in the mind. Because, for example, if you have this harmfulness in the mind, if you have this ill will in the mind, and you go around and you're kind of sarcastic to people, and you talk in sarcastic ways, or you have certain bodily actions that are harmful to others, that harm that you're putting out, it's going to come back to you because that's the natural law of gamma. It's cause and effect, action and result. If you put out harm, harm's coming back to you. So right here, the Buddha is helping you in the second step of the Eightfold Path with his guidance to help you understand this natural law of gamma that in order for you to progress towards enlightenment, you're going to need to cultivate a mind that has the intention of renunciation, this willingness to let go and give up unwholesome states, let go of false beliefs and perceptions, that you're willing to practice. You have this intention of practicing and cultivating more and more in the mind, this intention of non-ill will or loving kindness or goodwill, this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, getting rid of that animosity and bitterness, that anger and hatred in the mind. And here in right intention, practicing the intention of harmlessness, not causing harm to others and being incapable of causing harm. Because as long as you keep putting harm out, harm's going to come back to you. So you need to gradually evolve where the mind has the intention or the thinking or the thought of renunciation, non-ill will, and harmlessness. So I'll go ahead and turn things over to you guys for any questions that you have. 
You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. Well, on Zoom, Parikshit has a question. He writes, Venerable teacher, what's the difference between non-ill will and harmlessness? Both of them sound similar. Yeah, they're similar but different. Ill will is this mental object where there's this animosity or bitterness, this hatred, this anger, this animosity towards others, this resentfulness towards others. And it's what we call a mental object that it's really deeply rooted in the mind. And there's teachings to help you uproot this. That's what I'm going to be sharing as part of this group learning program is to uproot this and eliminate it from the mind. And we replace it with loving kindness. So it's this mental object, this bitterness, this animosity. Harmlessness is practicing being incapable of causing harm. It's like through your speech and your actions, being uninterested or disinterested in causing harm to others. Ill will is the mental object in the mind. Harmlessness is being incapable or unwilling to actually cause harm to others. Marcy has your hand raised. That's good to hear. Thank you, boss. Thank you, teacher David. Um, would you say that it is our intention that would uh, perpetuate or define the type of karma that we create? There's multiple things involved in about the type of karma that we create. What creates unwholesome karma? is craving anger and ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. That's all unwholesome gamma are going to be created through those three unwholesome roots. And then wholesome gamma is going to be produced through generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. These are called the three wholesome roots. So these are the direct opposites. So if you look at the unwholesome roots of craving anger and ignorance, the exact opposites are generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. So whenever you function through the three unwholesome roots, you're going to produce unwholesome gamma. Whenever you're functioning through the wholesome roots of generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom, you're going to be producing wholesome gamma. So by you practicing here right intention of renunciation, non-ill will, and harmlessness, this is the Buddha helping you and guiding you to move the mind towards generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. But you have to do the work, of course, to be able to accomplish that. But right intention sets the intention for what comes later. What comes later on the Eightfold Path is right speech, right action, right livelihood, and so forth. If you had wrong intention, for example, it would be really hard for you to practice right speech. It would be really hard for you to practice right action because if your mind is hateful and bitter and interested to harm people through your intentions, your thoughts, these are the thoughts that you're having in the mind, then your speech and your actions are going to emanate from that. It's going to emanate from that hostility, from that resentment. But when you clean up your thoughts, when you clean up your intentions, now you can have right speech and right action. And oftentimes where we run into problems in the unenlightened state is our intentions, our speech, and our actions, they're not in sync. That we might have wholesome intentions, but then when we start practicing speech, we don't understand how to practice right speech and everything falls apart. We're speaking in a certain way to somebody having all these good intentions, but our speech is disconnected from our intentions. It's not practicing the Eightfold Path with right intention and right speech. So now, even though we have the most wholesome intentions, we speak in a certain way and that blows up in our face. Or we have wrong action, for example. Even though our intentions might be pure, our actions might not be pure. So what you're doing as part of the Eightfold Path by learning all these individual steps is you're purifying all aspects of your life practice. And here you're purifying your right intention. So you have the right thinking, the right thought, the right intentions. And then we build on top of that with right speech and right action so that our speech and our actions can emanate from this right intention. And then we will produce wholesome karma. So teacher David, would it be to say to having that mindfulness or awareness of our intentions or of our thought process of our thinking to generate um, right speech, right action, is that 
Am I, am I understanding that correctly? You are. That this whole Eightfold Path, there's those eight steps, and the seventh step is right mindfulness, right? We're going to talk about that in two weeks as part of mental discipline. And what you guys will hear me describe is what right mindfulness is about, is awareness of mind. And all of these steps actually work together. So right mindfulness, awareness of mind, is going to help you be aware when you have harmfulness, when you have ill will, when you have the interest to hold on to things and you're not practicing renunciation or relinquishment, that mindfulness is what's going to help you to discern that and discover that. So that's why these eight steps, even though they're eight steps, they're not that you master one before you move on to the other. You're actually practicing all of them all the time. I think of it like if you remember the old time sound equalizers where there's like eight individual switches and you're kind of adjusting the sound to try to get the perfect sound coming out of the speakers and you're kind of tweaking and dialing the sound in. That's what these eight steps are, these eightfold path. You're not mastering one before you move on to the others. You're actually tweaking each individual one at all different times of your life and throughout your daily life. So where you see that you don't have the right intentions, you have to arise that through applying right effort because with right mindfulness, awareness of mind, you saw that your intentions were not wholesome. So therefore, you apply right effort to now arise right intention. So all of these things go together, which two weeks from now kind of explain how they all work together so that you can see how you need to be dialing in all of these individually and as a whole. Thank you, Teacher David, very much. Your guidance. You're welcome. That's what I Thank you, boss. Teacher David, you had mentioned renunci renunciation is the uh, willingness to let go of false truths. I was wondering if you'd be so kind as to give some examples of false beliefs or false perceptions of reality. Sure. So one of the big ones that oftentimes we have when we first enter into a path like this is you might have the belief or the false perception that rites, rituals, ceremonies, or worship is what's going to create beneficial results in your life. Oftentimes we're guided in different traditions to practice rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, and we're taught that this is what is going to bring improvement to our life, that if we worship or if we do these rites or rituals, but in reality this is a false belief, this is a misperception, that these rites, rituals, and worship isn't going to bring beneficial results in your life. Like if you sprinkle a little bit of water on you, or if you sing a certain song, okay, maybe you feel some pleasant feelings in the moment, but in terms of improving your life and the condition of your mind permanently long-term, there's nothing that a right ritual ceremony or worship can actually do to improve the condition of the mind and improve your life. You have to make the decision to improve your life. That's that natural law of gamma, cause and effect or action and result, the results of our decisions. If we are, you know, worshiping left, right, backwards, forwards, but we go outside and we talk harsh and aggressive with people, or we're angry with people, or we gossiped about people, all that harm is going to come back to us. It doesn't matter how much we worship that if we're causing harm, harm is going to come back to us. So this is one of the big misperceptions in the world. Here's a more simple one. If you take something like meditation, oftentimes people are taught when they meditate to listen to music and that you should listen to music while you're meditating. But if you understand breathing mindfulness meditation the way that the Buddha taught it, which I'm going to describe on Wednesday for you guys, is that that is actually the mind holding on. It's holding on to this music. And as long as you're meditating with music, your mind's not going to be able to let go. So there are certain things that you've been taught all throughout your life. Some of them have been true. So certain things have been really helpful in your life. And that's what got you to where you are today. But there's also certain false beliefs or misperceptions that we hold on to that we don't understand are actually wrong view or ignorance or the unknowing of true reality or misunderstanding or confusion, the more that you gain clarity through learning, reflecting, and practicing, independently verifying the teachings, then you can see very clearly what's true and what's false. So 
as you go forward, excuse me, as you go forward on this path, there's going to be teaching after teaching after teaching that you will need to independently verify and slowly putting all this together. If you have the willingness and the intention of renunciation and letting go of relinquishment, then when you come across something new and you investigate it, you independently verify, then you'll be willing to let go of, oh, that was a belief. I see that is actually not true. Now I see the truth. But if you're holding on and holding on and holding on and just thinking that everything you know is the truth, then you're not going to be able to progress on this path because the mind is holding on. It's not practicing the intention of renunciation. Thank you, Teacher David. One more question. Uh, is n- non-ill will, is that the same as loving kindness? Yes, it's exactly the same as loving kindness. So non-ill will is goodwill, and goodwill is loving kindness or the you know, active goodwill or the genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. Thank you, Venerable Sir. We have a question on Facebook from Rick. He writes, I know you will be talking more about wise effort in a couple of weeks, but is right effort the follow through of right intention? Uh, All of these steps interlink and they're all being practiced at all times you're going to see lots of different interconnectivity. And I'm going to be talking about this in a couple of weeks, but right effort is, you'll you'll hear about it. It's these four aspects of practice that you need in order to eliminate the unwholesome qualities in the mind and arise the wholesome qualities. It's the actual effort to do it. Where here with intention, we're just talking about the thinking or the thoughts in the mind, the intentions behind your speech and your actions and other things. Well, on Zoom, Jen has a question. In the first part of her question, she writes, thank you, teacher David. Some of our actions and speech are habits of long-standing reactions. We have formed in childhood and carry into a adulthood, correct? Yes, and this is what you're doing as a practitioner on the path to enlightenment is you're undoing all of that conditioning. As we grew up as very young children, infants, even in our mother's womb, we were taking in information. You know, if our mom was angry and frustrated and yelling and screaming during pregnancy, we were taking that in as a baby in the womb. And when we come out, if we are confronted with a lot of hostility and aggression in our early years and as we're growing, our mind is being conditioned that way. If we see our parents yelling and hollering and screaming at people and that's how they solve their problems, then that's what we tend to do. Or if we see our parents drinking alcohol or abusing drugs and that's their way of coping with difficulties in life, then that's what we tend to do as we grow up. It's not because of genetics. Oftentimes we think that it's genes that is being passed down from one parent to the child, but it's not. It's actually conditioning of the mind, that the mind conforms to what we see around us. As we're socializing as social beings, we're taking in this learned behavior. So when we see our parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents and other adults solving problems in a certain way, we will tend to do those exact same things because we're have this learned behavior. We're social beings. We're learning from our environment around us. But depending on what environment you grew up in, you might have a certain degree of pollution of mind, of ill will or hostility or animosity or difficulty problem solving, difficulty in communicating, difficulty in having open discussions with people. Maybe you don't like it when people disagree with you and you get angry when people disagree with you. This is because the mind's craving permanence and you learned this as you were growing up and the mind became accustomed to this more and more. The mind was conditioned to function this way. And now what you're doing is you're training the mind and you're unconditioning. You're purifying the mind. You're eliminating the pollution of the mind so that now this enlightened mind can shine through and you can have this radiance and this brilliance where you no longer have this pollution that is burdening the mind and pulling it down and experiencing all this darkness and these struggles and these difficulties. So one of the things that you need to be practicing as it relates to this particular step, this renunciation, is letting go of that conditioning and realizing that what you learned growing up isn't necessarily 100% the truth. 
There were certain things you learned that were helpful, I'm sure, or else you wouldn't have made it this far in your life. But there are certain things that the mind's holding on to in terms of the way it functions in the world that continues to bog it down and burden it. And what you're doing as part of the path to enlightenment is you're freeing the mind from this burden of this conditioning and this darkness and these untruths and these false beliefs. And when you uncondition the mind, when you purify the mind and you train it to no longer hold on to those things, that's when it can come into this better way of life that the Buddha taught. When he awoke from enlightenment, the Buddha didn't say, I discovered a new religion. I don't even consider the Buddhist teachings a religion. He said, I discovered a better way of life. And this better way of life that he discovered is understanding these natural laws of existence. And when you understand your mind has been conditioned like this growing up as a child and through your adult years, and that your mind is holding on to certain unwholesomeness and certain pollution, and you know that your goal is to actively eliminate that stuff, then now you can move towards the light and towards this wholesomeness. And you can kind of let go of carrying around the burden of any guilt or shame or anything like this because we are all subject to our environment. But now that we are adults, we can make choices of the type of life that we live and the type of decisions that we make. We don't need to continue to dwell in bitterness and hostility and aggression. We can choose to evolve and evolve the mind and grow to the point where we're no longer struggling with those kind of unwholesome aspects of the mind. And what we're doing is unraveling all of that from the mind so that we can bring the mind into this pureness or to the light, to enlightenment. In the second part of your question, she writes, how long can it take to improve and replace these unwholesome behaviors with wholesome behaviors? Everybody's different because everybody starts at different places, right? Because the universal truth of impermanence. So everybody has a different level of degree of pollution in their mind. So the progress of what somebody will experience is going to be different from one person to the next based on the amount of pollution in their mind. And then also the ability to learn, reflect and practice the amount of time that somebody has, you know, different people have different amounts of time in their life, depending on what their work situation is, their family situation and so forth. But I've heard students who've learned with me in as little as two or three days have seen some progress in the condition of their mind. And if you dedicate yourself to learning and practicing, you will see progress over the next seven months of this program. But the speed and ability of somebody to accomplish that is individually based on their own progress, their own dedication, their own growth. That's why I call this an independent journey. But I'll also add this, is that anybody who's on the path to enlightenment, even though you didn't ask this, Jan, anybody who's on the path to enlightenment, <clears throat> we wouldn't be interested to hurry up and get to enlightenment. If anybody's trying to hurry up and get to enlightenment, that's the craving, desire, attachment. You can't even have this mental longing and strong eagerness for enlightenment itself. When you hear about this enlightened mental state of being peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently, no longer experiencing anger, sadness, frustration, guilt, shame, fear, and all these other discontent feelings, sometimes people crave that and they want that so badly. Well, you have to even eliminate the craving for enlightenment itself and pursue it as a goal, an interest, and an objective that you gradually are working towards it. It's almost like you're sneaking up on enlightenment. It doesn't even see you coming. You're just kind of gradually working towards it. Because as long as we crave enlightenment, we crave that peacefulness, we want that permanent peacefulness, then the mind's going to be discontent anytime it's discontent. As soon as the mind gets sad, you're going to be even more sad because you're craving this peacefulness. So you gradually work towards it and as you're doing that, you see the discontent is gradually diminish. And that's how you know you're working in the right direction and that the teachings that you're learning from your teacher are actually working. And you know that you're independently verifying each one of these teachings. You're reflecting on them. You're practicing them. You see that through the accumulation of learning more and more wisdom that you put this together in your life practice 
And as the discontentedness gradually diminishes, that's how you know you're on the right path. Thanks, sir. No more questions for now. All right. Well, that's actually everything I had to share with you other than just to kind of refresh and kind of recap you on the path to enlightenment and kind of showing you the overall path itself. Because today we talked about right view, which is those three universal truths, the four noble truths, shared with you the problem of discontentedness, the cause of the problem, which is craving, desire, attachment, the mind's craving permanence, the elimination, which is eliminating craving, desire, attachment, which is what Wednesday is going to get you started with, is helping you to eliminate craving, desire, attachment in order to practice breathing mindfulness meditation. By practicing breathing mindfulness meditation, that's one of the antidotes or one of the solutions to eliminating craving, desire, attachment. And then the Eightfold Path is the path to enlightenment. By learning each one of these steps, bringing them into your life practice more and more, and you get more and more proficient at understanding what it is, and then also practicing it, as you do this for longer and longer periods of time, you will see the improvement to the condition of your life and the condition of your mind. Your mind will become more and more peaceful because you're now understanding with wisdom these natural laws of existence. So today we discuss that, which is right view, and right intention. Having the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of harmlessness. This makes up the wisdom of the Eightfold Path. This is like the foundation. And now the others are going to be building blocks on top of this. So next week on Sunday, we're going to be discussing right speech, right action, and right livelihood. This makes up the moral conduct. We're going to talk more about the natural law of gamma as a way of starting next week because this moral conduct that the Buddha is sharing with you is helping you to see how by you making wise decisions around your moral conduct that you're not going to be causing harm to others, so therefore harm isn't going to be coming to you. You're not going to be hearing about rules or commandments or things like this. You're not going to be hearing about punishment and rewards. That's not what the moral conduct is about. Instead, it's about providing you this general guidance that then you can practice through. So when we talk about right speech, you're going to learn about the five factors of well-spoken speech. And then within those five factors of well-spoken speech, you will have your own personality, your own character, and things like this. But whenever you're not directly practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech, it's going to cause harm in the world, so therefore harm is going to come to you. And this is guidance that the Buddha is providing you. And then you can independently verify those teachings. And by you independently verifying it and then practicing it more and more, you will see that your personal and professional relationships will blossom. Because in the past, when you spoke without the wisdom of the five factors of well-spoken speech, even though you thought you were speaking wholesome, there were things you were doing in unwholesome ways, and that's why certain conversations blow up or they don't have the results that you're looking for because you're not practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech, so therefore you're challenged in some of your personal and professional relationships. But by you understanding this wisdom and then practicing it more and more, you'll see the truth for yourself that your conversations and your relationships drastically improve. So we'll talk about right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And then two weeks from now, we'll be talking about the mental discipline of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And that's where you'll start seeing all of this piece together and how one part of the Eightfold Path connects with other parts of the Eightfold Path. So my suggestion for you from this point forward is start to work on deeply establishing right view. Now, whenever you observe that you have pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, observe how the mind is causing that itself, that it's craving, it's this yearning, it's this longing, it's these desires, it's this mental longing with a strong eagerness, wanting the objects of your affection, that these conditioned pleasant feelings arise, they change, and then they fade away. They're only temporary. And then there's these conditioned painful feelings that arise on based on some condition, and then they change and then they fade away. 
And then there's these neither painful nor pleasant feelings that arise, they change, and they fade away. Rather than blaming others, look internally for what's causing your own discontentedness. And when you can start understanding that more and more, then you'll be well-established in right view. And there's other aspects of right view as well, but this is how you get started. If you need to look around the world and independently verify the universal truth of impermanence some more, you can do that. Look around. Take the next few days as you're walking around. See if you can find something that's permanent. And there you're independently verifying the teachings and more and more you can start to understand these natural laws of existence. So I'll just pause for one moment and see if there's any questions before I close out the class and uh, say goodbye to you guys. If you have a question, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or raise your hand electronically to ask any questions that you like. Mm, let's not see any questions, teacher, for now. All right. Well, I'll just wish you all a very lovely rest of your day. Have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you either Wednesday or Sunday, perhaps both of those days. If you're unable to make any of the live classes, just know that it's recorded on the podcast, the YouTube channel, and Facebook, and you can just take in that content at your own pace. So I'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.